Raghuram Rajan is well known in India. He is uh, a professor at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business, but he's also a man well known for heading the high-level committee on financial sector reforms in India. In conversation with NDTV's Namrata Brar, Raghuram Rajan says the microfinance sector in India must be saved. Regulation is fine. Profitability of this sector, however, cannot be destroyed. He has also offered his views and reactions on the recently released Reserve Bank of India paper on foreign banks in, in this country. Named alongside U.S. Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke and Nobel Laureate Paul Krugman as the seven most powerful economists in the world, great pleasure to have Raghuram Rajan, the Professor of Finance at Booth School of Business at University of Chicago. Professor Rajan, thank you for coming here. Well, thanks for having me. Okay, let's start with Davos. You're a regular here and you've got your finger in a lot of pies. I'm sure everyone's pulling you from every possible place to get your opinion on a variety of issues. But to your mind, if you have to talk about the central theme, which has emerged so far and which will be the driving point of this summit, what would it be? Well, I think the big question everybody has is, uh, A, is the world economy in recovery? Uh, what pitfalls are there waiting for us? And B, have we done enough to make sure that this uh, occurrence of the, the crisis doesn't repeat again. So the financial sector reforms, the other reforms that are needed, global imbalances, international monetary reform, all those things are being talked about because all those things are in train right now. And you spoke about it in your recent book as well, Fault Line. You're talking about an interesting connection which has been a little controversial as well, and you're saying inequality was a reason for the financial collapse. Inequality, not subprime or the, you know, the government spend and the bank's uh, mm. recklessness? Well, uh, part of the reason, not this whole and sole reason. But uh, the, re the, the link is because people were falling behind in the U.S. Uh, and because the key to bringing them back on board was education, which President Obama talked about very strongly yesterday. But uh, the, the problem was you couldn't fix education in a hurry. And you needed to do something that would keep them satisfied. And one way to do that was to expand credit. So you see income inequality going up in the United States, but consumption inequality doesn't because credit is making up the difference. People are borrowing to keep up lifestyles. That, to my mind, was a big factor. The credit expansion and the political move to push credit, uh, housing credit especially, took us uh, over the cliff. It was one of the reasons. It wasn't the sole reason, but it contributed. So inappropriate lending to the poor. Inappropriate lending to the poor, some of which uh, certainly we're discussing in India today. Okay, that's interesting. Let's just talk about that then, the microfinance issue yes. as well, because you have a report on that and you've right. suggested something which is a little different from the latest uh, government release. Right. I mean, what, one of the things I think uh, uh, that is uh, true is that you can have excessive credit to the poor. You can push it too hard, they can overborrow, they can get into trouble. So you have to be careful about that, which means we need to share more information amongst lenders to make sure they don't overlend and so on. However, uh, a knee-jerk reaction to this kind of uh, crisis is, oh, they're charging too high interest rates. Let's cap the interest rates. The problem with that argument is many of these people want unsecured loans very quickly, and their alternative is the money lender, who charges 150%, 200%. So even if they're paying high rates, the cost of lending to them, especially small loans, and the possibility of default is high enough that, you know, those rates do seem unconscionable when we look at them, 36, 40 percent. But if the alternative is 150 percent, maybe it's okay to get that 40 percent uh, rate loan. And if, on the other hand, you cap the loan rate and say you can't lend more than this, you do one of two things. One, they disguise the interest rate in other ways, which are less transparent, and so that creates problems. Or two, lending stops. And would you want this person to borrow from a microfinance uh, unit or to borrow from a money lender? And my guess in many situations you would prefer the microfinance. Now, what we don't want to happen is microfinance turn into the money lender. And that's, right. that's really where some of the debate is. And also then, Professor Rajan, what we don't want to happen is the microfinance not being responsible for the loans it's given out. Because here it's virtually, it gives out the loans, yes, at high rates, 40, 60 percent, but lesser than the money lender. But it's getting this money from banks which are easily giving it out 
uh, the money. So it's kind of a ripple effect and the banks have the end blame. Well, uh, of course, I mean, this goes back to you want any entity making decisions to be fully responsible for the decisions you make. If microfinance thinks that it can make the loans, then turn around and inflict the losses on the commercial banks and walk away squat free, that's a problem. And that's why it's very important that we don't overly subsidize the lending from the banks to the microfinance units and say, you know, don't worry about the credit risk, this is part of your priority sector norms, don't worry about anything at all. They have to apply some due diligence. And so we have to make sure market discipline doesn't break down. Uh, in fact, the parallels to subprime are there because market discipline broke down in subprime lending because there's so much money coming from the government that the private sector entities simply did not bother to figure out whether in fact people could repay. So you would want to be careful about, uh, about pushing this too hard, both from the private sector side as well as the government side. But I think imposing blanket limits is prob problematic. Okay, but why it has it not worked in the same way as it's worked in the Grameen Bank, for instance, in Bangladesh? Now India is the largest microfinance uh, country in terms of size, sheer numbers, yeah. and the volume. Why has that kind of model not worked entirely? In well, it, it, it can, and there are some microfinance um, uh, in institutions in India which, uh, which follow much of that model. Now, you have to remember, the Grameen Bank gets capital which is, by all counts, subsidized. Uh, now, if you want this uh, sector to become standalone, uh, private capital has to see the possibility of profits. Profits is not a bad thing, provided it's not excessive. And this is why we have to make sure that you're not exploiting the consumer at the end and that they are getting good value for money and they're fully aware of what they're getting into. That's, that's a whole task. Information, financial literacy, all that has to be uh, enhanced. But you can't say you can't make money off the sector because if you can't make money off the sector, private capital is not going to flow in. You're going to constantly say it's up to the government and the government doesn't do these things very well. But do you believe the recommendations so far are in line? Well, I, I, I think more regulation of the sector, more information sharing, more transparency, these are important factors. Uh, I am less sympathetic to the idea that you know, the sector shouldn't make any profits and that we should have interest rate caps uh, at low levels for the sector. I mean, I, you can probably talk of high interest rate caps depending on the size of the loan, uh, but I think we have to be very careful about closing down the sector. Okay, economics uh, coupled with the social responsibility. Exactly. Okay, let's move to another topic where you also have a committee, the Raghuram uh, Rajan Committee, on the banks issue, on the foreign banks issue. And lately RBI came out uh, with this paper on foreign banks uh, where they believe that a wholly owned subsidiary model would be conducive. What do you feel? Because when you came out with your committee report, the RBO was a bit cold. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, uh, uh, I, I don't remember whether we suggested this exactly, but this was the, 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 the natural consequence of the fact that we're not going to get global reform quickly in which some kind of global resolution mechanism is in place. If you don't have a global resolution mechanism, uh, it's much better for country to have separately incorporated subsidiaries of global banks in their country so that they know the money is there. It can't be withdrawn and taken to the center or taken to New York, London, if in ca case the bank gets into trouble. So I think it's prudent regulation until we get some grand global re resolution mechanism, which is probably five to 10 years away, if, I, if that. Um, we should demand separately incorporated subsidiaries. And my discussions with foreign banks in India suggested that, you know, if we needed that done, they would do it. Oh, they would do it. They would do it. But your discussions with RBI in terms of all the various committees you've chaired, how, how easy is it to do work with RBI? How receptive is it to your suggestions? Well, I, I, I think that no central bank can be a bank which moves with the flavor of the moment, right? So any changes it has to look at cautiously and think about what the long-term implications are and then move. Uh, I think the RBI has been, uh, and certainly Governor Subarao and I have a very, very good uh, relationship, uh, it's been very um, receptive, uh, certainly to thinking, uh, analyzing uh, the kinds of proposals we put forward. They don't agree with everything. They shouldn't agree with everything. But for example, trying to expand the branching, uh, they've taken some steps there. Uh, for example, on this uh, asking for new entry for banks 
and trying to think about how that new entry, what shape and form it should take, they certainly are moving on a number of dimensions. Uh, uh, Deputy Governor Subir Gokaran has talked about the bond market and how that needs to be revived. I mean, all these are consistent with what we, we, we were saying in the report. And the point of the report was to get a dialogue started. And, uh, and certainly that dialogue, it seems to me, is ongoing. And measures are coming out uh, at, at reasonable intervals. OK, let me now move across to the global sphere. And you know, the India perception globally, because you had the benefit of exploring both mm -hmm. worlds. Professor Rajan, do you believe this whole India story is justified right now? We've seen a mood boost here in the, the World Economic Forum da at Davos. But do you believe that there are still so many problems? You know, you've got food inflation, corruption, um, you've got issues in terms of inequality and this whole inclusiveness. So there are a lot of hindrances as well. Well, I, I think this is where we have to be careful of uh, thinking glass is empty or the glass is full. Yes. And we veer between that. No, the glass is half empty. Uh, let's be conscious that it is also half full, that there is an India story, which is a very good one, of uh, you know strong growth over the last two decades uh, and an incredible change in the lives of the people. So that we should not forget. But as Indians, we should let other people talk about that and instead worry about the things that you know, are holding us back still. And the problems you mentioned in the short term, certainly inflation, the capacity uh, of the economy, the potential for growth is a big issue. I mean, can we grow without substantial inflation? Uh, what is that growth rate? And unless we fix the capacity constraints, which are not just physical, it's not just railroads, it's not just roads, but it's also things like uh, human capital. Mm -hmm. You know, do we have enough plumbers? Do we have enough electricians? Do we have enough civil engineers to do, do the road projects? Those are the questions we need to try and address. Uh, so one is be aware of those constraints and start moving to address them. And don't, you know, we, sh we need uh, to actually go about and, and do that. Uh, at the same time, I think we shouldn't suddenly think that uh, we need to achieve perfection. You know, countries have grown rich with some corruption. We, we want to put a stop to corruption wherever we can. But let's not assume that we'll get to Scandinavian levels of corruption overnight. It's a process. And so, yes, it's good to have the press highlighting these things. Yes, it's important for the government to take action. Unbridled corruption can just grow and kill the economy. So it's important that we have this debate. But let's not, you know, overnight say we're rotten to the core, we're no, never going to get anywhere. We have done a lot. So be, you know, confident, but also recognize we have fragilities. Okay, so enjoy eating the cake, but don't ask for the cherry on top right now. Absolutely. Wait and watch and keep working hard on that. Absolutely. Professor Rajan, a pleasure having you on ATTV. Thank you.